Welcome to Remote Controlled, Variety's TV podcast. I'm Deborah Birnbaum. Every week, we'll bring you conversations with some of the best and brightest in television, working behind and in front of the camera. On this week's episode, we're talking about the final season of Bates Motel with star Freddie Highmore and executive producer Carrie Aaron. So stay tuned. Hi, I'm Deborah Birdman, Variety's Executive Editor of TV. And I'm Michael Schneider, Editor-at-Large at Variety. And it's our pleasure to welcome Carrie Aaron and Freddie Highmore of Bates Motel. Hi, guys. Hello. Hi. We feel like we're on your talk, talk show. show. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is what we've been pitching. And I feel like we should pitch it now so everyone gets to choose whether or not they want the we Mike and go. Deb yes. well, we mornings say, with Mike and Deb. <laughs> <laughs> we should say, uh, uh, in, in our break room, there's a view of a massive billboard for season five. And, of course, it's a shot of you, Freddie, in, in Vera Farmiga's lap. Mm-hmm. And, of course, she's in that... She's not looking por- so good. Not, well, well, she's, she's looking, looking great. She's looking she's great, great, actually. Yeah, as a, for a dead person. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's the right amount of Spoiler intrigue alert. and... Yeah. Well, Hopefully exactly. people saw it by now. <laughs> by now, we should know. But the right amount of intrigue and creepiness and excitement for this final season. Mm-hmm. We, it's all happening now. This, this is it. This is leading to the story that everyone knows. Are you ready to say goodbye? No. I know we've just finished filming the last, the last season, and it feels odd. So as I was, I was saying earlier, I just think it... If if it's grief now that the show is over, I'm definitely still in the denial phase of thinking, oh, it's not actually... <laughs> the, the sadness, I think, will come at a later point. Yeah, it feels very much alive somehow that we'll all be going back and doing it again soon, even if that's not the case. Well, Carrie, how does it feel for you? I sort of pre-grieve things, so I've I've been preparing for, like, two years for the show to be over. <laughs> So, in a certain respect, like, it's fine. You know, it had to end, but 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 it was... I think the funny thing about it was how it's... You expect it to end, like, in a, some huge way, and, and it just ends. Like, it's like the day of filming is done, and you kind of hug people, and you say goodbye, and, yeah. you, and you go. And so, and that part of it doesn't feel real. It feels like um, there need to be fireworks or something, <laughs> because now I feel like we're just going to go back. Well, the good news is you'll, you'll have a lot of time uh, promoting the show and, and yeah. getting together for that. And, of course, uh, when the, the series finale actually happens, I'm sure there'll be a round of, of gatherings that you all can yeah. grieve properly when the time <laughs> yeah. comes. The funeral of sorts. Like it's, and this is very true for, for Freddy, too. It's like a, it's a world that I've lived in in my head. For for six years, like it's still there. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that mm. aspect of it, I think, is partly why it doesn't feel so final. And, and the, the physicality, you, sorry, there, no, the, just the physicality of being on set one day and then literally the next day you sort of return to say goodbye to people in the state. You know, the house had been ripped down and out in Alder Grove where there's the exterior. Again, it's like yeah. the roof was off and they had this big digger just literally like smashing down the Go motel. The it's like, they didn't leave it there? No, no. it was like 12, the 12 hours day. later. They started taking it down. And we were oh, like, what do you mean? It's going. Oh, it's not at all. cold yet. I know. Um, well, that was a little hard. All the furniture ripped out. Yeah, it was Not really sad. <laughs> yeah. Did you guys take anything from the set? Yeah. What'd you take? I took stupid stuff. I, I, yeah, you had the smallest things. I did. I, took, I wanted actual items from the house. Like, there's this green tray that's in the living room that I remember just watching during every one of those, like, super intense scenes in the living room. So I really wanted that to put in my kitchen. I don't know why. And well, I took some some photos. And I've some got the manager's things. badge, which I think is my favorite prop of Norman's, um, <laughs> and some version of his manager's jacket. Yeah. So maybe I, you know, I'll just check people in at home, and it'll yeah. be great. I'll what? still be. It's one of his dresses. Yeah. Yeah. And I was going to say the relationship, I want to get back to Bates Motel, but the relationship between the two of you isn't over yet. You've got another project you're working on. You want to talk yeah. about that? Uh, you know, go ahead. Yes. No, it's exciting. That's. I guess that's also what keeps us um, feeling optimistic that this isn't the end. Not only just for the two of us working together, but everyone on. We have such a great crew and we in do. Vancouver. You just think, let's all stay together. But uh, it's a project called Babyface, which is based on the life of Babyface Nelson, a Depression-era gangster. So that should be... That should be fun if that ends up going. We're just working on the... This week, actually, we're finishing Bring up the story. story. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a, it's a romance basically set in a it's a love story set in a, in that era, um, and it's tonally it's tonally a lot of fun. 
Well, it seems like a good uh, jumping off point after, uh, you know, F- Freddie, for you, this this was an uh, opportunity, uh, Bates Motel, to mm-hmm. write some scripts and, and to direct, yes. right? So so talk about sort of getting your chops wet uh, <laughs> working uh, with Carrie on, on Bates. Yeah, I mean, Carrie's like, you know, the best person. I've only, I say this, I've only worked on Bates Motel as a, t- a you know, one television show, but I can't imagine anyone better than Carrie to, you know, run the writer's room and lead the entire team and so I was just lucky to be a part of the of the writing um, in seasons four and five and yeah I'm just you know grateful to have it I guess it came out of this desire to want to be involved in the wider process and everyone had it really with Bates I mean Nesta's directed so wonderfully Max also directed an episode this season um, in season five and everyone cared so much about the show i mean that's what what it sort of stemmed from for me is wanting to be involved beyond just acting because you feel like you want to contribute you don't want to just go home and and let it be in between every season you want to live inside yeah and everyone had that sense of that same desire to want to you know have as much uh input as they and offer their opinions as much as they could yeah and I think I read somewhere that uh, a lot of your your uh, co-stars uh, appreciated your script because you know as as an actor you knew exactly sort of what would be a uh, you know a juicy scene or a, <laughs> uh, like how they could have some fun chewing uh, chewing the scenes. But, well, that's nice to hear. Yeah, that thank. Um, no, it's always. I guess perhaps do you think I write differently because you're an actor? You see it in a different way, or well, no, I think it's because you're smart. Smart first, after second. Yeah. But Freddie has always, from day one, like if he had a question about a scene, it was so intelligent and it was so he he understands scene structure. For someone who's never you know studied it or written mm-hmm. before, you know, but it, but. It, He's been doing it since he was seven, so it's like, you know, you learn scenes, you take them apart, but he really understood it, and if he had, he would say, like, well, I don't understand why this is here, and shouldn't it be leading to this, and he, he was always right, and and there's not, like, that many notes, like, I would say, like, yeah. that, that come up on the scripts, because we're really careful with them, you know, but he's smart. Talk think- about your approach. I know you t- you had said from the beginning that you knew where this season was going to end. Did it end up where you thought it was going to all along? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> to, to, yeah. What can you say without spoiling? I mean, yeah. it's uh, it's it's fun to intersect and go past the psycho world this year. Yes, that's true. I'm thinking more about the end, though. Though, sort no, of like that. Even yeah, the, you know, writing the whole it. season, no, it's, or? I mean, the season itself, the approach of writing it. Um, it was very much about about answering the end of last season, which is what is the, what does a world look like that you're completely conjuring up out of your own body and energy um, and brain, um, and you know just the, to, the our goal is to tell a real story about someone who believes he's living with his mother, um, and when in fact the mother is dead, but make her very real. So that you care about the relationship, just as he would, you know. Um, and people often throughout the year would. It was funny because I I can't tell you how many times, like when you're talking to a director or a like executive, whatever it is, how many times I would hear, um, but but she's not real. Why is she doing this? <laughs> and it, and and that's that's the part you have to let go of. She is real to him, so you have to be on the ride with him. And that was always the goal: is to care about everything as much as he did, um, and maintain sympathy and empathy for him. You know. Well, someone's making the food and, and helping him carry those bodies, so... <laughs> yes. And you kind of have to let... Yeah, I mean, there's a part of you that wants to dissect all of those individual moments about... So he's eaten breakfast, but what did he really have for breakfast? Or what did he... Which is interesting to a certain point, but it's it, it wasn't necessarily about those like specifics of day-to-day life. It's more about the emotional journey that Norman and, and his mother... Um, go on during the season and in a way what was great about about the way sort of Kerry saw it and and oversaw the writing on every on everything is it didn't get bogged down in in details there were specifics and the relationship is so specific at points but it's more about this you know wider sense of who they are as opposed to it being it's driven by character yeah 
as what? opposed to sort of specific incidents that after a while would become tired if it's this sort of imaginary world. It's not. It's Everybody not the, wanted rules yeah. for mother. But there was, was like, no, and, 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 too much. Yeah. yeah, it was very much against rules for yeah. her because you're, when you're crazy, there's no rules. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Craziness is not linear. It's, yeah. you know, it's all over the fucking place. <laughs> that makes sense. So what challenges did that present for you as an actor? How did you approach it? Because it feels like you were in your own kind of space, certainly, as, as we saw in the first couple of episodes of the season. Yeah, what I like about the, particularly the beginning of season five from Norman's perspective is this duality to his personality, the side that he presents. And we see that in, in Psycho, in the movie, you know, the this, this sort of very warm perhaps a little odd but very friendly charming, charming manager um, and he's able to present that sort of vision to the world and puts on his manager's badge and with a smile and sort of comes down and checks people in and then goes back <laughs> into the house and this sort of changes and has this completely other life going on and how he's juggling with maintaining keeping up the facade of how he presents himself to the town and to um, Madeline uh, in particular and then when he goes home how things are very are very different and the tables have, have turned and he's keeping very careful notes about his blackouts he's trying that's what's sort of heartbreaking about it is. Norman's journey this season is he's trying to be good he's trying to find he's trying, trying to, to make it work up. and be grown up and you know you just sort of think well it can you he's know it's never gonna be yeah yeah tries to work out when he blacks out so he can control it. He's seeking control all the time in a situation that and comfort, just becomes yeah. uncontrollable. <laughs> I'd be curious what your uh, conversations were like with the, with the network and studio when you first told them that, okay, we are, we're, it's time. We're, we're killing off Norma. It's, it's happening, and we still have more story to tell next season. And, and uh, You know, Carlton and I felt so strongly about it. I think we presented a very... Um, I mean, I think I think there was a question of, are you sure this is the? T but we were pretty sure, yeah, because we wanted room to do this season and to really have it to to have it be able to intersect with Psycho because it felt appropriate to go through that at some point. Yeah, yeah, toward the end. Yeah, so maybe it was Vera who had the biggest question of, okay, so what am I? You kidding me? Exactly. Yeah, no, I know Vera is Vera is so. She's such a she's such a team player, and she's just has the greatest attitude. Um, and she actually really enjoyed playing mother this year, um, which was really fun. Mother, like mother she's is a fun. funny character. Yeah. She's a fun and funny character. She's completely different this season. She is. I mean, she's she's um, she sort of has qualities of Norma, but she also is can just slip into this completely amoral cold space but that's also quite funny so it's it's a real it's a real fun balance she's she's kind of seamlessly mercurial i would say oh yeah there, uh, there's there's a moment in the the first episode back where she's she's harping on norman's google search yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, there's several, i mean i laugh out loud i would say like maybe four or five times every episode in editing because vera's just so funny in this part because the character is like a smart ass you know she's funny She's brilliant. I, lo I love the scene in the Very dining dark. in the dining room dark. too, which is in the yeah. first episode. Yeah, yeah. It just sort of this whole it just so beautifully kind of sets up this new yeah. dynamic between the two of them. But there's just this underlying humor the whole time. Yeah, Norman's actually, you know, <laughs> he's there eating on his own, but but her well, niggling and her. The, I mean, yeah, the, the, and the ways in which mother now more than ever has that ability which Norma always had, but to a greater extreme to sort of turn mm -hmm. so immediately and from one emotion to another um, and playing with that sense of if she's not real we're still on the ride with her we still understand her but she can do certain things in a more heightened way or change scenes in the spur of the moment in the same way that if you think about it from sort of Norman's mind's perspective, you're sort of toying with these conflicting emotions all the time and it's not necessarily a smooth journey from one to another um, in 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 the way that emotions develop in it, within real people interacting with each other, if that makes sense. But the thing, I mean, that was also a challenge with with writing Mother is that is to make her real. She had to want things, mm -hmm. right? She had mm -hmm. to have like motivation. 
and and if you consider that she was created in Norman's mind as a person to step out of him and protect him, and that's her job, and that's what she's always trying to do, but she's not... It's not like she has all the answers, you know what I mean? She's not God. She's like a person that lives in him. So she's trying to figure it out. And she often knows more than he does, but she doesn't know everything. Um, but just getting inside that like crazy <laughs> web of psychology was so much... It was it was frustrating at times, but, but so rewarding, ultimately. Right, because there's that mystery of you know how he happened upon that wallet in the first episode. Yeah. And trying to figure that out and unravel it. Yeah. You know, she knows the answer because he doesn't. Yeah. But- you know, but she doesn't know everything. Like right. she's she's feeling her way in the dark too, um, which is just it's just super. I don't know that that whole like the the sort of bent psychology has just always been like a favorite thing of mine. Um, Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf is one of my all time favorites, um, and I've often thought of it during this show. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Talk to you. I mean, I know you wanted to stay true to the world of Psycho, but not make this about the world of Psycho. So how do you strike that balance? What was it you were trying to go through in this final season? We were trying to, well, I mean, the primarily, first and foremost, we were trying to tell the last chapter of a story about a mother and a son and do justice to that story. Um, secondly, we wanted to tell the story of, um, you know, this isolation and someone trying to function in it and survive in it. And then thirdly, to to present, to kind of collide with Psycho, but not not... We didn't pull Bates Motel into Psycho. We pulled Psycho into Bates Motel. Mm -hmm. Um, And we really wanted to have the stories kind of, like, run into each other, intermingle, and and then have a culmination that was profoundly meaningful for Bates Motel, but still telling telling, um, some of the mythology of Psycho. That was our goal. And it was... It was, uh, we worked on a lot, but it's, it's, we're really happy with it. Very, very pleased. Yeah, I was going to say, because you had a lot more characters to service as well, so yeah. to, to, you know, find out what happens, you yeah. know. Rihanna. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's Rihanna. There's, there's uh, Rihanna. How did that work out? <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah, it was, uh, it was quite an event, actually. It was, yeah. Yeah, it was, uh. An event. Do Details, tell. please. Yeah. Yeah, I just oh, no, because, no, no. because our because our set is super low key normally. Yeah. You know, and it just became it just became like, you know, security badges and I don't know. It was just it was just everyone was very excited. You know, I mean, it just it was it was exciting. And she was yeah. excited too. I mean, it's yeah. I just love the way that it came about because she, or was it you and Carlton found that sort of sort of an article where she would said how much she enjoyed watching the she show and Natalia wanted and, to be and Carlton um, was like what if what if she did Marion well, Crane why didn't you do it um, so she was excited yeah. to be there it was nice that she had a real enthusiasm to be there no one was forcing her to be, <laughs> to be <laughs> there yeah, <laughs> she was, no, she's no. like oh I've got to do this for a week yeah. or so oh, you she know. was lovely she was, she was brilliant so is it the story of Marion Crane that we know or is it a variation on the story of Marion Crane it's a variation but it's it's um you know, there's there's the roots of the same of the story, you know, but it's a contemporary woman. It's a it's a woman with a little more edge than adorable Janet Lee, who I love. I'm yeah. not picking on her or anything, <laughs> 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 but like, so, <laughs> but yeah. So you know, this this Marina is a little more um, just a contemporary version. Well, you already have a lot of shower curtains. Uh, we do have a lot of shower curtains this season. <laughs> there's a stack. I know. Oh, yes. A stack yes. of shower curtains. I know. <laughs> and peepholes. Yes. Yeah. I love the peephole the scenes. Peephole's fun. They're so good. So creepy. That makes many appearances, yeah. And wigs. And wigs. wigs. I know. At the end of um, wigs and dresses. The end of two, right? Talk That's, about putting uh, on that wig. It was very big the first time. You know, it's like, it was one of those, I don't know what they're called. A wig? No, but a special <laughs> type of, <laughs> some type of wig, you know, like oh, some really? particular, uh, there's some, I don't know if it's a brand name or, anyway. And it sort of, the first time it was like this huge billowing thing. So we had to kind of cut it back quite a bit and make it sleeker. It looked very good, I And thought. then the dresses, the matching dresses too were fun to, when Vera and I would wear the same one. 
Um, although there's this polyester one that makes you sweat a lot. Yeah, I don't like polyester. Polyester. Either. I'll avoid no, those no. dresses in yeah. the future. Yeah. Fashion tips are pretty high more. <laughs> well, the crew would be like, oh, he's not wearing the polyester one, is he? Oh, dear. No. <laughs> oh, Please no. take him out of that dress. Put, it, put the other one on that's much lighter and less sweaty for everyone to be around. <laughs> Uh, which uh, which which episode did you write this season? What what number? The seventh. The seventh, the seventh so, one. So very close to to the end. So did you feel like you got to have your say, a, a part of sort of you know helping conclude this story, or or what was that like to sort of be there? It's so close to the end, sort of shaping what these characters were doing. I mean, it, all sort of writing, I guess, in the show is you have your. From being in the room, everyone pitches ideas on every single episode. So there's certainly, it's not like you go off and, you know, write your own thing and surprise everyone with a new twist that they have right. to then go and work <laughs> out. So in that way, it's pre-established. But it was, it was, uh, yeah, I feel lucky to have been involved in that one and directing the eighth one um, because it did feel so final and that everything was suddenly coming to you know, very quickly to the end. Yeah. And I guess it kept me busy too, which was good, so I didn't have too much time to think that it was all all ending so soon. You just keep on going, and then suddenly it's like, oh, this is it, this is it, we're done. And how much directing have you done? In the this past? was the first This was the first, the one. first that's episode that's I, I directed, thought. yeah. So, so and that's very good. Oh, well, Not a you. surprise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, yeah, genius, right? Yeah. So, so, um, I, I, the, the, the old uh, you know adage that uh, eventually every actor wants to direct was that something that you'd been sort of working toward and really wanted to do and, and uh, you finally were ready to do in this final season or what was that experience like? I think so yeah yeah I'd always had the um, I'd been intrigued by it and I, and I think to a certain extent working on a television show you as an actor you find yourself leading more than on a film because directors I mean obviously we've got great directors who have come and done multiple shows and Tucker being the main one who's you know he must have done a third of all of the episodes or something by the end uh, but for the most but for part ones who come in and out there's a sense of of leadership that you know you have to take control of certain things and it's not you're getting to know the director and they're getting to know you and the material as much as anything because they have those sort of seven days of prep on a completely new show and then go off and shoot it and I guess that was what I felt fortunate is that I certainly knew the tone of the show and there wasn't a period of adjusting to what the show should be like or how scenes should feel because that was instinctive. So I guess it was a great place to learn in that way. I want to talk to you about the other characters who we really haven't talked about. Um, Norman's been keeping um, Norma's death a secret from poor Dylan. Yeah. So obviously it's going to have a lot of impact on when poor Dylan's going to find out. Um, well, I mean, part of, I think, the planning of this season was was about, at least in my head, was, was kind of like all roads lead to home. And, and everyone at the end of the fourth season had sort of scattered out for their various motivations. And, and the season was different ways that people are sort of pulled back in to the web um, and whether or not they survive the web. Uh-oh. No. <laughs> that, that, that feels ominous. That does feel a little ominous. Come on. Come on. Dylan's got a baby. I know. Dylan and Emma seem so happy. They do. They have At the a beginning baby. of the season. They do. <laughs> At the beginning of the season. You always promised me that Emma was going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But um, the, the other thing that uh, you... So you bring on this, this new character in, in Madeline who looks mm-hmm. a lot... Like Norma, yeah, um, and, and of course, dead That's Norma's dead mm. Norma's not too happy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so there were many wigs that we all had Norma it looking was, like wigs this it season. Was a yeah. Very wig happy <laughs> season. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, no, the the um, uh, character is a, a, a girl who's new um, to town, who's married to a guy who has gone a lot and is lonely, and um, kind of bonds with Norman, but Norman is just fascinated by her because she reminds him so much of his mother. Um, and I think what was really interesting about that to me was that he doesn't know his mother's dad on some level, but he feels this loneliness that he can't understand. And so when he sees her, it has this huge power over him because he's so lonely, you know, and it reminds him like of his mom. And so that was just a really interesting idea. And it was also a little nod to Vertigo, obviously. Yeah. 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 
Wonderful little shout out. <laughs> exactly. And I've got to ask about our my, our good friend Chick, who we see the return of. Yeah, right. He's great. He, isn't he great? And in, in, in fact, next uh, episode is one of my favorite ones with him. Yes, he's got a huge part in number. Yes, in episode three. Is he friend or foe or somewhere in between? I think you, that'll. That's kind of what the third episode is about. In terms, like Norman and him, it's just so funny because they only met for the first time in that you know pivotal scene way back at the end of season four when he kind of gets through to Norman and makes him realize that oh my mother's actually dead here on the couch um and that's their sort of first <laughs> bizarre meeting um, and Chick just doesn't judge him yeah he's, he's, kinda, he's, he's like I kind of he's just like this kind of dark po- dark lame poet I would describe mm. him as but he just kind of gets those like larger darker amoral things and doesn't really phase him no and then it's and in and sort of I guess the third episode in some way starts to you know uh, evaluate whether he's to what extent he's using Norman um, or for something knows, else or knows, or knows he's using Norman him. or genuinely cares about him and is trying to help him or whether he's doing that for his out of pure love or whether there's an underlying sense of I don't know manipulation about the way he wants Norman or to is he encouragement really, yes. in or t- is he really towards insanity too that's the other thing like does he really actually just Wants of company because <laughs> he is he's yeah. like a super isolated lonely guy um but so that, it's just great because there's so many different levels and layers to him um because he's crazy but i don't know not unlike all people i suppose right <laughs> why do we do why do we do all the things we do <laughs> like what's our motivation why are we here I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's romero who's doing away in jail and yes. then he'll get out at some point, won't he? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And, yeah, and talking to him, I don't know, was such a good idea. No. He's going to go, like, I love, put Romero in his place. I love the, I love the scenes between Norman and Romero. Energy when Norman... It's, a, it's sort of Norman pretending to be the man as much as he ever has and feeling <laughs> like if he, you know... He's going to go and really put him in his place. <laughs> How dare you try <laughs> to kill me? Just makes him seem <laughs> weaker and weaker. Um... <laughs> But yeah, that was. There's yeah. some really fun uh, stuff with Romero coming up. I hope he taunts him about the eyeliner. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Yeah, That's all. exactly. That's all. I know. Just you keep using that in prison, worse worse, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, how does he do it? How does he do it? He has like full on like <laughs> cat eyes by the end of the season. All right, we should probably let you go. But give us. How about this? Give us one word to describe the finale. One adjective. Ooh, that's, that's, yeah. That's a stumper. Point right? two. Can he have one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can yeah, 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 you tell you your agree on the same one? It's like a game show. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're going to tell this me too. It's like a newlywed game now. I know. We get a talk show and we get a game show. I like it. Okay. Well, you can choose which one of them. Cathartic. I'm going to say cathartic. Explosive. So cathartic and explosive. Mm-hmm. You heard it here first. Nice, nice. <laughs> right. and, and by the and way, romantic. And ro- oh, <laughs> oh, no, no, I was trying romantic. to get more adjectives. <laughs> I know. Sorry. Well, but, the, the good news is, if you're ever feeling nostalgic, you can always just go straight to Universal Studios. They still have a they have a motel there. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> so if we ever see Freddie, just like you know, <laughs> when we're on the tram, yeah. just like it's like, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> just like hey, I just missed it. That's all. Got like a beach chair. Yeah. Exactly. Hey guys. Yeah. Well, thanks for stopping by. Mike and Deb's morning talk show, otherwise known as our podcast. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's show. We'll be back next week with another great episode. We'll be talking to the executive producers of two fantastic FX series Ryan Murphy, who created Feud and Joe Weisberg and Joel Fields of The Americans. See you next week. Mm-hmm.